Okay, Meg, I, we, we can get started. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Noor Kokiar, the Executive Director of the Washington State China Relations Council. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's event, which is jointly produced with the US-China Business Council. When talking about US trade with China, the media and government officials usually talk about the fortunes of large US multinational companies. However, there are many small and medium American companies with operations in China or who source most of their product from China, and we rarely hear their stories. These companies are subject to the same issues that bedevil the large corporations, such as a worsening US-China political relationship, tariffs, COVID-19 lockdowns and restrictions, and supply chain issues. Today, we have three panelists with extensive experience either running their own small and medium business in China or with assisting SMEs to maximize their business with China, who will share with us their experiences uh, and observations about how small and medium industries are managing in today's difficult environment. We've also asked the panelists to comment on whether government programs, assistance programs in particular, are beneficial to their operations and potential areas for improvement. Our moderator today is Elizabeth Rowland, who will introduce us to the US-China Business Council. But before I relinquish the mic, let me say a few words about the Washington State China Relations Council. The council was founded in 1979 after Deng Xiaoping visited Seattle. We have the honor of being the oldest state level organization dedicated to improving bilater the bilateral relationship between the US and China. Today, we produce educational programs, facilitate communication between government agencies and private enterprises in their interactions with China, and we provide information and analysis about China to our, to our elected representatives. And now before I pass the mic, let me note that uh, WSC's, WSCRC's next webinar will be next week, actually on May 4th, when we're gonna interview two Washington natives, both now living in Shanghai, and they're gonna recount to us what life is like under lockdown. So please go ahead and uh, take a look at our website for more details about that event. And now I'm pleased to introduce Elizabeth Rowland of USCBC, who will uh, proceed from here. Thanks so much, Noor, for, um, for kicking off the event. Uh, I am the Director of Subnational Initiatives at US China Business Council, and USCBC and uh, WSCRC are really sort of sister organizations. We were both founded pretty early on in uh, USCBC's case, 1973. USCBC is a private, nonpartisan, nonprofit organization of over 260 American companies that do business with China. Uh, we provide information, advisory, advocacy, and program services to our member companies of all sizes. And uh, through our offices in Washington, D.C., Beijing, and Shanghai. Our mission is to expand the U.S.-China commercial relationship to the benefit of our membership and more broadly, the U.S. economy. In uh, 2021, last year, USCBC launched 50 States, 50 Stories, which is a new subnational initiative that I now lead dedicated to small and medium-sized enterprises and state-level U.S.-China trade. Our goal is to uplift, uplift the voices of local communities and SMEs like those on our panel today in order to make sure that the broader public, as well as government policymakers, know what a crucial place that trade plays, uh, trade with China plays in their local businesses and local economies. Um, we do this through stories published on our 50 States, 50 Stories webpage. Um, as well as events just like this one that we host with local partners across the country. So I'm so glad that WSDRC uh, was interested in partnering us, partnering with us on this event. And I'm really excited to uh, meet and learn from these experienced entrepreneurs that we have as panelists today. So let's dive right in. I think Noor has something to say, but Yes, Elizabeth, I, I apologize. You know, I didn't introduce you very well. So let, let me do that so that, that our, uh, our participants know uh, a little bit about your background. Elizabeth is actually um, very well suited for today's uh, seminar because she actually was ran a small and medium enterprise in China. Um, she moved to China in 2007 
where she started her own online jewelry company sourcing from China. Um, so she's she understands the issues. Um, I, I'll mention that while she was in China, she also worked for the American Chamber of Commerce there, AmCham China, as a policy analyst and an editor for the Chamber's American Business in China white paper. She also worked for the law firm of uh, Covington and Burlington, or Covington and Burling as a senior manager of policy analysis. And after, after her five years in China, Elizabeth returned to Knoxville, which is her hometown, and founded the TN China Network, which was a nonprofit to promote trade and investment between Tennessee and China. And she served as a director from 2014 until she stepped down from that role uh, in 2020 to run for the Tennessee State House. So as I, I mentioned, she has lots of experience in this area and we're really pleased today. And I apologize for not introducing you earlier. So back to you. <laughs> Thank Elizabeth. you. No, no problem at all. Appreciate the nice introduction. Um, so we, we are going to plug in to the chat box, the panelist bios. We have limited time, so we want to make sure you probably have read them all already anyway, because they are on the event announcement. Um, we want to let the panelists speak for themselves and dive right into the content uh, rather than me read all of their bios. So. Um, you can see the, the bios in the box if you'd like to refer to them again. Uh, so we are going to, um, after, after the panelists give their brief self introductions, um, I'll follow up with some moderated questions. And in their self introductions, they'll especially highlight um, what their experience is that's most relevant for this conversation. So what kind of business they're doing with China. Um, at any time, you're welcome to pop your questions into the, the um, Q&A box and we will try to get to them. Please include your name and your company or your organization if you have one so that uh, our panelists can know who you are, where you're from. And I also wanted to say that this event is being recorded. Uh, we will be posting it on our websites uh, after the event so that others can refer to it later if they, if they missed it. So first, let's kick things off here with Jean DeMunt. She is co-founder of Seattle-based Echo Products. Uh, Jean, if you could please uh, give us your a little self-introduction. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, I first went to China in 1980, at, taught English, and since then have spent my entire career involved with China business. I've worked for Chinese government trading companies in New York, US-based import companies on both coasts. Um, I've worked for the state of Washington, the China Relations Council, the US CBC before it was the US CBC. And now I have a small business in the power sports industry that imports um, about half of our products from China. Great, thanks for that intro. What a great diverse background you have. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Chris May, co-founder of Shanghai Fai Industries and a native of Portland, Oregon, though now he is based in Shanghai and is currently under COVID lockdown. So we are um, thinking of you, Chris, as, as you deal with that and we look forward to hearing about your experience. Um, uh, please uh, give us a little bit about your background. Yeah, thank you so much for, uh, you know, the well wishes, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, my name is Chris, obviously. I was uh, born in Portland, Oregon, um, and I moved over to China in 2015. Um, since then, I've worked in, you know, large Chinese conglomerate groups uh, over in Suzhou, as well as larger U.S. US-based um, entities here in Shanghai, um, as well as in import-export, um, you know, during, during, my t during my experiences here. Um, in the recent, basically, two and a half years, I uh, helped co-found a factory plus trading company called uh, Shanghai Fine Industry. Um, we mainly help source products for uh, larger distributors such as Walmart, Metro, Dollar General. Um, we also have a bevy of uh, small, medium enterprise sort of clients, SMEs there, uh, which we help with sourcing uh, in China as well. Excellent. Thank you. You have a lot of interesting on the ground experience to share with us. Um, now, Stanley Chow, president of All In Consulting based in Southern California. Stanley, please take it away. 
Hey, thank you. Uh, I'm Stanley. Uh, I lived and uh, lived and worked in China and Hong Kong for 20, 25 years, uh, working for such companies as Philips Electronics, Merrill Lynch, SoftBank, and Kingston Technology. In uh, 2000, I started my own consulting firm, uh, helping foreign companies, mainly uh, SMBs, uh, do business in China, uh, both selling into and outsourcing. And, and we've done uh, well over 120 or so projects over the past 20 years, uh, mostly handle industrial products, uh, B2B. Uh, the vertical markets we handle are aviation, automotive, uh, consumer electronics, manufacturing, oil and gas, uh, B2B software, mining, and uh, green tech. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm based in Los Angeles. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Well, you have a really broad look at things, so that'll be really helpful in this conversation. Uh, since since we're on you right now, uh, I'd like to pass you the first question. Um, so a lot of news about the U.S.-China relationship right now is, is pretty negative. There's a lot of doom and gloom. And yet many large American companies with a presence in China report that business is quite good, actually. What are you hearing from your clients and, and the companies that you're exposed to? Um, how it's going for small and medium-sized enterprises in China? Yeah. Are they generally profitable? And what about the SMEs that source products from China that you work with? Yeah, I tell you, business is still booming. I mean, uh, if you look at 2021, uh, foreign direct investments into China were, I think, well over $300 billion, which I think is a new record. Um, I'm still getting phone calls for people wanting to go to China, whether it's selling to, setting up manufacturing, or outsourcing. Um, I know about 100 companies in China. Uh, none of them have told me that they are planning to relocate out of China. None of them are coming back to the US. Some are looking at this China plus one option, but nobody is leaving because the market is so big in, in China. SMBs are still doing very well. Um, let me give you an idea. Uh, Pre-COVID, pre-President Trump, out of every 10 companies I worked with, three would kind of fall out in the beginning when we did the market study. Their, their products weren't right. Out of the seven remaining, five would do very well over the course of five years, and two might falter during those five years. Those numbers haven't changed even today, mm -hmm. even with the governments uh, disparaging each other. So the market is still very good in China for SMBs and for multinationals. Very interesting. Chris, are you, are you feeling and hearing the same thing on the ground out there? Yeah, no, I agree with uh, a lot of what Stanley has said. And I think um, a major portion of that is, you know, you already have the major infrastructure as well as, you know, the range of expertise uh, here in China, um, comparatively to, you know, other countries like Vietnam, you know, Malaysia, Southeast Asia. Um, you know, you see you have a larger, um, I guess, working body of, you know, more middle, higher end manufacturing capabilities here in China, uh, especially in regards to, you know, die casting, tooling, molding, uh, these sort of, um, you know, important, important integral parts of manufacturing. So, you know, when you have the environment like that, um, it's obviously conducive to still do business and um, still do business and source here in China versus other countries. Um, yeah. Thanks. Um, Gene, I understand for you, um, tariffs have been a challenge. How is that impacting your company's uh, ability to do business with China right now? Well, um, right now, actually, we are okay. The products that I'm importing have not been hit with big tariff increases, but we don't know how long that's going to last. And in the past, 
I've had the situation where a container will leave Shanghai and the tariffs will be raised while the container is on the water, just really messing up my price structure. And we're careful to um, make sure we have margins that can accommodate those kind of shocks when they happen. Has, have those margins changed um, through throughout the past couple of years? <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, they've think a little bit, but, um, you know, we're looking this year at doing some price increases, um, which we haven't had to do up until this time. Mm -hmm. So would you consider your company sort of starting to adjust to a new normal of the tariffs or um, what, what is your sense there? Well, I think it's, you know, the thing that's really hitting us now is not so much tariffs as shipping rates. You know, I've really postponed ordering because of the shipping rates. I, um, I'm hoping that that's a temporary situation and that the prices will come back down into something that's closer to uh, normal, what, what used to be normal, and that this is not the new normal because that really will impact my business. And I'd be interested to know what my fellow panelists um, are seeing in that regard. Yeah, Chris, Stanley, um, what, what are your thoughts on the, the tariffs and some of these supply chain snarls and uh, shipping costs going up? Yeah, um, regarding the tariffs, um, what, what I'm seeing from my customer base, um, there's been this argument about who's paying for tariffs. Um, I'm seeing the Chinese suppliers, uh, they can take about 20 to 40% uh, of the cost for the tariffs, but the American uh, companies, the importers are taking about 60 to 80% of the brunt of the tariffs. So American companies are, I, I feel, are, are suffering, especially SMBs. The, the multinationals have holding power. So there's a lot of pressure right now on SMBs to lower costs or to pass it on. And I'm, I'm also seeing a lot of, pre a lot of pressure on, uh, on the folks in the White House where small companies are, are pressuring the White House to, to back off on the tariffs because we have inflation so high right now. So hopefully, I think we're gonna see those tariffs maybe come off in the next uh, 12 to 18 months, ho hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, and uh, just to add on to all the talk about the tariffs basically, um, in my experience, uh, you know, working with both larger and then smaller uh, importers, it's been a really renewed focus on basically landed cost pricing um, when we're working with our clients. So for example, um, you know, being able to kind of help our clients with a lot of the pricing on their products by, you know, improving packaging. Uh, Gene mentioned the increasing logistics costs. So uh, there's been a large focus on us to kind of help with packaging requirements, you know, maybe before in a 40, 40 high cube or in a 40 GP, you could put maybe, let's say, you know, for example, you could put like 500 products into there. Um, there's a renewed focus on, you know, how can we improve the packaging so that instead of 500 products, maybe we can fit about 600 to 750 products. Um, on top of that, I think there's been more innovation uh, on the planet side about actual manufacturing. So for example, you know, beforehand, maybe you had a mold that uh, was only doing single shots to, you know, single product. Um, the, you're looking at, you know, you're looking at the more increased labor costs on that end, um, obviously the increased raw material costs on that end. Um, and then, so what they're looking at is, well, you know, what if we put in the direct investment into building a new mold, making it into a one, you know, one shot coming out with two products, one shot coming out with four, eight, something like that, that, incre that increases your productivity from the manufacturing side and then, um, you know, reduces labor costs. So I think the tariffs have kind of forced a lot of the Chinese manufacturers to take a lot more of a holistic approach to, um, you know, where can we cut costs along that uh, line? But, you know, as Stanley said, I would completely agree with him that even when you go into all those, um, 
sort of cost cutting or you know imp improvements on your packaging that can maybe affect you know 20 percent to 30 percent of the pricing on those tariffs um, and then the other 60 to 70 percent is going to be bore by the importers and then i think on that end again pass down to the end consumer so mm -hmm. well, it sounds like it, at least uh maybe an unintentional benefit is that we might end up with a little bit less waste and smaller packaging going forward so that could be a, a you know some kind of silver lining out of the situation um so it seems like there's a barrage of, of various different challenges that are hitting companies all at the same time. Um, the tariffs, the supply chain, and then there's also COVID-19. Um, I'd like to hear how COVID-19 is impacting uh, your all's businesses. Um, Chris, why don't you go first since you're in Shanghai? Yeah, no. Yeah. Um... COVID has definitely been a bit of a double-edged sword, I'd say, for us. The zero COVID policy over the last couple of years. Um, right now, um, obviously, uh, offices and our manufacturing have uh, been shut down. Uh, manufacturing was shut down for a period of time, but now we're into closed-loop manufacturing. So basically, um, we have... Can you describe uh, that for some people that might not uh, know about that? Yeah, so basically the government is allowing uh, manufacturers to stay open during all of these COVID lockdowns, basically by, you know, keeping essential factory workers within the, um, within the, within the actual factory uh, on that side. So, you know, may, they, have, they have very limited movement, basically going from the factory to perhaps like a dorm or something like that, or, you know, in extreme cases, even staying within the factories. Uh, during the entire period of time just to uh, keep the manufacturing, um, you know, keep operations running on that end. So that's where we've been kind of at on that side. Um, as far as supply chain crises, uh, obviously there's been a lot of delays with, uh, with uh, some of our suppliers as well, um, basically providing products to us and getting them abroad. I mean, we've had a lot of cancellations or cancellations of sailing dates uh, within the past two years. Um, and I think that's kind of caused our end clients to be a bit more risk averse as far as, um, as far as kind of building that into the timeline. So for example, we've seen a lot of our clients basically pushing up their timelines. You know, originally maybe they were looking at uh, you know, Q2, Q3, kind of, you know, doing all the sourcing, getting all the pricing, doing virtual buy tours and everything like that. These are kind of getting moved up into Q1 instead, just to build in any sort of uh, delays that can happen on that end. Um, you know, last year as well, you saw a lot of increased, um, increased demand from companies abroad too, just so that they were keeping warehousing. Uh, basically keeping extra products on hand versus, you know, the traditional logistics and manufacturing of like just in time sort of uh, ideals. So I think, you know, for us on our end, we've seen a lot of uh, basically just adding in more risk aversion. Gene, what, what are some other techniques your company is using to, to adjust to some of these supply chain and other issues? Well, we've, we've never been um, a just-in-time kind of business. We've, oh, the business is very seasonal um, with a big ramp up that starts in the early spring and then uh, tapering towards the end of summer and fall. And if we miss the season, it's, it's really a disaster. So we have traditionally um, held very deep inventory. Um, and, you know, it, in order to get the best pricing um, and to have product on hand when our customers need it. And I, I'm an importer and a distributor and I sell directly to retail uh, establishments, retail motorcycle shops for the most part. Um, so when they want the product, they, they want it right then for customers who are coming into their store. So um, deep inventory 
it's interesting to hear that other people are going to uh, deeper inventory practices because that's really always been something that we've believed in um, because the person who has the product when the customer wants it will get the deal. Um, so, you know, and, and I, I just regret that over the last few years, COVID has prevented me from going back and visiting, you know, my suppliers because I, I like to maintain those relationships in person. Um, so I, I miss that in-person um, contact. Yeah, definitely. So you haven't done the two-week quarantine uh, adventure yet? <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Stanley, what about you? Um, are there any um, tricks of the trade that, that you've um, found your clients uh, working on to navigate all of this? Yeah, before uh, COVID, most of the buyers, most of the importers were working with their main supplier, their tier one supplier, kind of the OEM who would buy everything and put the parts together. Now we're going beyond that. We're asking, our, we're asking the tier one supplier, who are your sub suppliers? We, we, we want to meet them. We want to know who, who are the suppliers that will have the bottlenecks. And we will reach out to them and actually buy the components ahead of time and store it at the OEM. So that, that's, that's the major difference. Instead of just working with the OEM, we want to know who those second and third tier suppliers are, hopefully see them in the future. And when things start to get short on, on, on products, we'll go ahead and start ordering months ahead directly from the tier two to ship to our OEM. Hmm. Interesting. Um, have, uh, to kind of to shift gears a little bit um, from the, the supply chain and other challenges, you know, there's one other big challenge, obviously geopolitics um, that often gets in the way of commerce. Uh, has the, how is the worsening or has the worsening um, U.S.-China political relationship impacted the way that you all do business with China? Um, you know, Stanley mentioned China plus one strategy where um, manufacturers might source a large part of their goods through China, but then have another country as sort of a safety valve option. Um, do you see a lot of SMEs following the strategy or is it too costly for them? Um, do, and do, do your uh, companies have plans or your clients have plans for contingency strategies if the US-China relationship continues to get worse? You want, you want me to take this? Uh, um, sure, this? why don't you go and then, um, and then we'll go to uh, Jean. Okay. Um, we've really hit a inflection point now, uh, particularly with the uh, things going on in uh, Russia and the uh, Ukraine war. Um, companies are really now thinking about China plus one. Um, companies before did it, but it was more the easy stuff. Uh, basic plastic injection products, uh, textiles, furniture. You're now getting the companies that make complicated things, you know, refrigerators, microwave ov ovens, computers that need, that are looking for other places to make it. And they're doing it for two reasons. One, because they don't want all their eggs in one basket in China because of all the uh, supply problems. Two is they're worried that China may not be a good place to import products anymore, to export out of China. Uh, Janet Yellen said in a speech a few weeks ago that U.S. companies have to begin doing friend shoring, meaning make stuff in allied countries, be it Mexico or Canada. And that, to me, signals 
that maybe China and the U.S. in terms of geopolitics are heading heading maybe towards a a bifurcated economy. So you want to stay in China for China, but you need to look plus one for that that friend shoring. With that said, though, it's extremely difficult. Uh, I'm working now with a refrigerator company. We've been trying this for years to go to Mexico, but but the, but the refrigerator company has a about 60 suppliers. We can get maybe 20% of that in Mexico. The other 80% still has to come from China to Mexico, and then we assemble everything together. We can never get a hundred percent from Mexico. So it is costly uh, and it, 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 it is an extra burden, but it has to be done for both supply chain reasons and for this, this so-called friend shoring that, 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 that seems to be taking shape. Great, thank you. Um, Jean, for a company like yours is, is for, for products like uh, you import, is friend shoring an option or is China really the main place to get the products you need made? Well, my, my products are not terribly complicated. Um, they're plus, primarily plastic injection molded um, with some quality, I mean, they're face shields that have to be safe and clear, which requires a certain level of molds, but it's, it's not a product that couldn't be manufactured somewhere else. Um, you know, the cost of making new molds somewhere else is daunting to a very small company like ours. Um, and, you know, if I were in a different uh, phase of business, as opposed to and life as opposed to where I am now, which is in my 60s. I might be thinking more about China plus one, but um, at this point, we're committed to China. We have great relationships. You know, things may get a bit more costly, but I don't see us doing, leaving, leaving China, or diversifying um, at this point. Do, do you have any concerns about the relationship, US-China relationship deteriorating further in the well, sense of how it might impact your business? Well, you know, I think the relationship is very likely to deteriorate further and, and it saddens me after a lifetime of working between the US and China. And to some extent, I feel like I want to maintain my part of my teeny tiny little part of that relationship. So, you know, I'm hoping that being a, a, an importer from China, being a customer of China um, will be uh, welcome no matter what the, the politics are. And we've had bumpy politics in the past, you know, after Tiananmen and, um, anti-bourgeois movements in the 90s. And, you know, I think the intertwining of the economies is such that at least for my business lifetime, it will continue. Mm -hmm. Great, well, I, I, I like to hear this, that commitment and optimism. And I similarly feel saddened by, by the situation going on. Um, Chris, uh, what would you like to add on this? Um, you know, your company is is headquartered in China. And how how does that feel as, as an American living there trying to navigate these uncertain times in yeah, the US-China? Yeah, obviously, obviously, I think uh, geopolitics always are kind of in the back of our mind. Um, but I think there's some major... Um, you know, major kind of folks on the road there, as Stanley said, um, you do see uh, larger companies able to, you know, put in this foreign direct investment to, you know, Mexico or to Southeast Asia. Um, I think that's definitely a bit more prohibitive for some of our SME clients. Um, 
you know, just basically the cost of uh, tooling, the, all that, you know, all the component parts that you need, it's difficult to get them in these other, other Southeast Asia or Central American countries. Um, even at that point, you know, the tooling and mold design, all that sort of stuff is still being done. Quite a bit of it is still being done in China just because cost-wise it's cheaper. Plus, um, you know, as far as the timeline for building one of these products, it's much faster here in China versus everywhere else in the world. So um, I think for SMEs, it's still advantageous to, you know, look into China as a sourcing, as an area to source from just because of, you know, the infrastructure that's already there. It's going to be much easier for you to implement your products, get all the raw materials that you need for it. Um, but, you know, again, you do see companies looking into, you know, risk aversion. And I think that's, you know, not just the geopolitics side of it. I think it's just COVID as well. Um, you know, you can't have, as Stanley said, you can't have all your eggs in one basket. And I think a lot of um, companies abroad are kind of figuring that out. Mm -hmm. We have a question that I'd like to turn to from the audience. Um, Michelle Yuan uh, and Owen Hack from China Virtual Assistant. And their question is regarding localization against the backdrop of the gradual reopening of China and lowering bottleneck costs, do you see a huge long-term demand for US SMEs for hiring local associates on the ground in China? Has that demand changed at all um, through the COVID period and as, as hopefully China starts to open back up? So would anyone like um, to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I think I can I can provide a little bit of insight uh, being on the ground here. Um, I think for SMEs, it's now very, very important that you have, you know, some sort of expertise in the China market. Um, you know, people that are able to kind of guide you through the process. Obviously, you know, having someone on the ground always helps. Um, it's they're much more attuned as well as, you know, it's always faster for them to um, kind of react to any sort of the situations happening in China currently. And as we've seen over the past couple of years, you know, situations can change very, very quickly. Um, whether that pool of applicants is going to still be available, um, especially in places like Shanghai after uh, the experiences with the lockdown, I think is going to be a little bit more difficult. Um, I think you're going to see quite a bit of um, of brain drain, I think, from uh, foreigners living in China um, and then moving back over either, you know, back to wherever they're from or even to places like Singapore, uh, Tokyo, Japan and places like that. So, um, yeah, I think the, in question, the question is, you know, I think you need to have these sort of, um, you need to have these sort of people in place here in China, I think, now to be successful as a SME, but it's getting harder and harder to kind of find the correct people to do that. Interesting. Gene, what kind of team do you have supporting you on the ground in China versus in, in the U.S.? If yeah, any? I don't have anyone in China. I, I deal with, my, with the factory directly and, um, you know, phone and, and virtual. So um, and I, I never have had anyone since we closed. We did have a, um, a factory that manufactured helmets, but I left that business um, in 2015. So um, since that time, the business that I've done, I've just done remotely. Stanley, do you have any thoughts on this one? I'll give you my, my, uh, my situation. Uh, Pre-COVID, I had an office in Shanghai and I had seven people. Those seven people, uh, I could not run my consulting business properly. Uh, they either went back home or I had to let them go or they switched jobs. I, I don't have anybody there now. Post-COVID, when things get back to normal, I'm going to need to hire people. So I, I think there'll be a big hiring spree, at least for, for myself. This question of resources um, brings me to another a question that was 
inspired in part by uh, a great WSCRC member, former Congressman Don Bonker. Um, he's written about and advocated for strengthening, strengthening U.S. government support for SMEs to help them grow their exports. And part of the problem is that many SMEs don't even know that uh, what government programs are already out there to help them. And uh, I was curious, what are some of the programs or government offices that you all rely on or your clients rely on to do business with China and navigate business with China? Um, who would like to take that one first? Um, I, I will. I've, I've used three resources. Um, two come from the Department of Commerce. Um, from time to time, they have uh, visits to China where they'll invite companies or ask companies from certain vertical markets. Uh, the hot markets today in China are uh, the EV market, aviation, oil and gas. So they'll issue a press release saying, are there SMBs out there in, in the US interested in visiting China? And they'll go to China for a week and you'll visit companies, potential partners, potential customers, and you'll get a pretty good feel of what your industry is like in China. They also have a gold key service. So for $950, um, they have re representatives in I think five or six cities in China that will set up meetings for you, whether it's customers or, or, or even competitors, so you can find out about the market. And lastly, um, the Hong Kong government, they have a group called the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. And they are more than, more than willing uh, to see you when you're in Hong Kong and also set up meetings for Hong Kong companies. And many of them are actually Chinese companies with rep offices in, in Hong Kong. Um, Chris or Jean, would you like to add anything about what resources you all have drawn on? And I know, Jean, you don't export, but, or I guess neither one of you export, but <laughs> are there government resources that, that you've benefited from? Um, I think, you Chris? know, for, for us, um, you know, as, as a local company here, uh, it's technically a local company here in China, um, a lot of the government resources that we're sort of benefiting from um, are, are more on the domestic side of it. Um, as far as our clients, um, you know, we always, uh, it's, I think it's always a good idea to kind of join a lot of these sort of business councils as well as like Shanghai Chamber of Commerce. Um, the Shanghai AmCham is, uh, has a very large um, presence in Shanghai. So I think joining these sort of groups, uh, you know, for the networking purposes, as well as any sort of resources that they can provide to, um, you know, their members, I think that's uh, always a good thing to do, especially if you're considering, uh, you know, coming into coming into business here in China. So USCBC, all these sort of um, networking groups, I think are important. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the plug. <laughs> Jean, Jean, what were you going to say? You know, Washington state is arguably the most trade dependent state in the nation. And while the federal government really provides nothing to importers in terms of assistance, they really overlook the benefit to local economies I mean, I employed at, at the height of our business, I employed 16 full-time employees in two warehouses. I, I had um, 35 sales reps across the country, all of whom were contributing to their local economies. You know, I spent hundreds of thousands of dollars every year with FedEx shipping things. So as a driver of the economy, um, importers and imports get short shrift from the federal government. Washington State used to provide some services to importers, and I can um, endorse Stanley's uh, respect for the Hong Kong Trade Development Council. They were a resource that I referred people to many, many times 
importers as well as exporters um, from the US in my time at Washington State. So um, trade goes both ways and the economic impacts of distribution shouldn't be overlooked at either the state or the federal level. Thank you for bringing that up. I think that's a super important point. And you know, if if you have affordable products that you're able to provide to the the retailers that are your customers, then that means that those retailers' customers have more dollars to buy other companies' products as well, and that makes that makes that money go that much further in our economy um, and support more companies. So. Totally agree and, with that. and there are products that are no longer manufactured in the United States and motorcycle helmets is a prime example. Um, the liability and the manufacturing um, requirements for certain types of helmets just make it cost prohibitive to, to manufacture here. And we have helmet laws, people need these products. So there, you know, there are cases where importers should get a little more respect. <laughs> I agree for sure. Um, De, so we have another audience question. Kerr Gibbs is asking, are you expecting to get any COVID related relief from the Chinese government? Uh, they gave some relief for SMEs back in 2020. Will they do it again? Um, yeah, I can, Chris? Uh, yeah, I can uh, answer that a little bit. I think uh, you are going to see extended COVID relief for companies, I think, here in China coming up, especially in Shanghai. Um, recently in Shanghai, they mentioned that they are cutting rent for quite a few SMEs uh, in in the area for, I believe, is a period of anywhere from like three to six months, like rent free. Um, on that side. So I think you're going to see a big focus um, after every, after the lifting of the lockdown of, uh, you know, the, the government here supporting and sort of propping up business, um, I think, here in Shanghai. Great, thanks. Um, another question came in. In terms of, and this is Harry Hu, in terms of U.S. exports to China, um, what is your take on related U.S. SMEs experience dealing with Chinese counter tariffs? Any pricing pressure on that front? Who would like to take that one? Um, I'll take a stab at it. Um, most of my client base are industrial companies. They're, they're selling some sort of high tech uh, that goes in a uh, uh, in a bigger system, whether it be a automotive, an airplane, an oil and gas rig. Um, it's a must-have, and whether it's twenty percent more or forty percent more, um, the Chinese customer has to buy it. So I haven't seen too much pressure because the products that my clients are selling are, are, are must-haves. And uh, they really can't find a second source at this point. Or if they have a second source, it takes way too much time to qualify a second source maybe from, from, uh, from Europe. So, and that's, that's part of the process when you begin to sell into China, you want to make sure that you don't have any competitors, that your products cannot be copied. So in times of tariffs, your product will continue to sell in China. She, uh, Elizabeth appears frozen. Okay. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, I can I can jump in here. Yeah, it does look like Elizabeth Elizabeth is frozen. Um, Stanley, I had I had a question for you that, that yeah. I found your comments kind of intriguing. You're saying if um, you're an OEM supplier, that you as the final customer might even go to their suppliers 
and source product and, and basically warehouse them at the final manufacturers or whatever. Is that that's true? And and that, if so, how how does the OEM supplier react to that? They're like, okay with this? You're kind of taking them out of the system in some ways. Yeah, we are and we're and we're not. We're actually doing them, we're actually doing them a favor. Okay. So the OEM says component A, we have a tough time getting. And, and it's going to look tough for for the next year, but I don't really want to pay them for a, a, a year's worth of in, inventory. I, the customer here in the U.S., I'll do it mm. to ensure I get this OEM product on time. I will go to you know some secondary city, Chengdu uh, or, or wherever. I'll go visit this supplier. And I'll give him some money to guarantee it. So the OEM is actually quite, quite happy with it. So I think in the long run, all parties are pretty happy with this. Yeah. Just, just so long as the OEM is aware of, of how much we're paying, how, ma how many we're ordering, and those parts are getting to the OEM. You know, just make everything transparent. Don't give them the perception that you're trying to go behind their back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and would that be for, I mean, are s small and medium companies able to do that or is it more bigger, bigger companies that are doing it? It is mostly the larger companies, but SMBs are starting to do this now. Mm -hmm. um, when we're able to go back to China, hopefully soon, a lot of the SMBs are preparing this and, and ha having me set up meetings with all these secondary suppliers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and, and at least get to, get to know them and have somebody that we can make a phone call and, 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 and push them to get these components out to the OEM. Yeah. It, it's a kind of financial support for your manufacturer um, that, if China goes the route of tightening credit, it might be even more welcome by the by the the OEM if if it gets harder for them to borrow money. Okay. Yeah, no, just to add on to that, I mean our factory in Quonsan, we actually have clients that do that with us as well. Um, you know, we uh, the factory on our on our side we do tooling die casting. Um, and then on top of that, we also have plastic injection um, and we do like power tools. So for companies like Metabo, Stanley DeWalt, we build the power tools from them. So for them, we've seen them, uh, you know, given that we have enough warehousing available and everything like that, they'll come to us and be like, how much warehousing, how much space do you guys have? Uh, we want to purchase, you know, like, for example, the batteries or something like that. We want to purchase extra and then leave it in your factory to make sure that we aren't running into choke points within the manufacturing of these components um, during that time. So I think, you know, like I said, I think a lot of OEMs are very willing to do this. Um, one, when you purchase these things in bulk, you, obviously you're going to get a lower price. Um, comparatively to when you're buying these things, you know, you know, maybe a thousand at a time. So OEMs are willing to do this to, um, you know, it helps them lower their costs as well. And in turn, lowers their client costs as well. Also builds, I think, that relationship between your manufacturer and then your end client as well. Um, kind of strengthens that tie with them as well. Because it's, it's seen as almost, you know, it's almost like an investment. So Elizabeth, I'll hand, I'll hand the floor back to you. So glad you're back. I don't know what happened. I just shut down. <laughs> so thank you for taking the baton. Um, and I, I, I missed a little bit, but um, we, we just have about five minutes left. I, I'd like to hear each of you, um, you know, what do you see as opportunities going forward? Um, and what, what kind of advice would you give to other SMEs about um, how they can enter the market or be successful during this difficult time? Or um, what advice would you give to our government, whether it's the state level or the national level um, in the US or China about 
how to improve this situation going forward, how to, how to make sure that SMEs can continue to be successful in business with China so that we can um, continue to grow our economy here in the US. Would anyone uh, who would like to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off here. I think um, for SMEs, it's becoming very, very important now to, you know, basically have someone who understands the Chinese market, has someone who can kind of guide you um, in building your supply chain, you know, finding the correct and vetting the correct uh, suppliers um, for you on that end. I think, um, you know, beforehand when there wasn't quite as many pricing pressures and there wasn't as, you know, the margins were a bit higher, you could be a little more lax in, you know, going off and finding a manufacturer that could, um, you know, provide you a product at a certain price and you could probably still make money on it. Now you're seeing a lot more, you know, tightening pressures, not just the tariffs, um, you know, the COVID situation, we're having to have more warehousing. So the margins, I think, for SMEs is becoming tighter and tighter. So it's going to be more and more important to have the correct people on your team and have the correct sort of expertise there to kind of guide you through the process rather than, you know, being able to kind of go out and find all this sort of stuff on your own. Gene, I understand you had said you're sticking with China, but if you had to do it again, if you were advising a, an SME that's just starting out, what would you recommend? Well, um, I, I've advised a lot of these just starting out when I was with the state of Washington. And I guess I, I really, even at that time in the 80s and, and 90s, told them what Christopher recommending you really need the right people on your team and if you don't take the time to understand the market and the the, the environment you know it's very difficult to be successful and I think um, if my background were not what it is you know background in in Chinese language and an interest in China um, that predates my business in, I would not have, um, I, I wouldn't recommend starting out in China at this point. I, um, I think it's very difficult. It's not going to get easier for the current time. And um, I think there are a lot of competitive markets. And what I've said to my suppliers for years is, you know, you hear that behind, you hear that, those footsteps, that's Vietnam, that's Indonesia, that's everyone else. Look to eat your lunch. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been a great run for me, but um, would I do it again starting now? Probably not. Stanley, do you have anything to add as we close up? Sure. Um, in general, it's, it's never been easier than now for SMEs to get involved in China. 20, 25 years ago, it was only the large corporations. You needed a lot of money. You needed, you know, connections. Uh, you needed a big brand name. Today, there are so many resources for you to find out how to sell to or how to outsource. You have people like, like uh, Christopher in China. You can go to China today you don't really need to know Chinese. And of course it helps, but so many young Chinese people today speak English. It's very easy to get information. The key though is you have to find out what's going on in China. I, I tell people who, who don't know about China, you don't know what you don't know. And you have to go to China, see what's going on, and then you know what you don't know. Once you get at that stage, you can ask the right questions. Get to that stage where you know what to ask. And then you can accelerate your, your base knowledge very, very quickly. China is not necessarily for others. As, as Gene said, it's probably not the best place now to be making uh, motorcycle helmets. Vietnam, Indonesia, those places are, are probably more cost-effective. But China 
is still the place for very advanced products. They're, they're moving up the, uh, the uh, food chain where, where, where you don't just get products made there now, you get products developed there. You get the next generation of products developed now because they have such great engineers there. So things are changing. So, 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 so don't, don't be so pessimistic because you're hearing all the geopolitical stories going on. Go to China and get to a point where you know what you don't know. That's a, a good positive note to end on there. Thank you, Stanley. And thank you everybody um, who's joined the call and to the Washington State uh, China Relations Council for partnering with USCBC on this event. Um, thank you to Noren Mann for helping to organize it. And to all of our panelists for taking the time out of your day to be here. Before I leave, just wanted to plug another upcoming event besides uh, WSDRC's event next week that Nor mentioned. Um, we have a, another joint event on May 10th, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on American Northwest exports to China. Highlights from USCBC's uh, 2022 export report. Um, we're going to be doing that in partnership with the Mansfield Center, Northwest China Council, Business Oregon, and the U.S. Commercial Service in Seattle, Portland, and Boise. So uh, we're going to be talking about the export data from Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho. So please come for that one. You can RSVP on our websites. And... Um, you can, we'll also, if, oh, there it is. The event link is in our chat box. Thank you, Mon, for that. Um, thanks again, everybody, and I hope you have a great night. Appreciate it. Thank you. Or day for Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank, thanks, everyone. <laughs>